in a little while. It is really good to have Jeremy Marshall here with us tonight. And uh, I'm just going to spend the next half an hour or so just chatting with, with Jeremy. And as we've already said, if you have any questions um, that you want to ask Jeremy or Joe, uh, you can do that. And again, hopefully David will pop the uh, screen on here. What a master is becoming at this Zoom, Zoom thing. So there you go. Any questions for Jeremy or Joe? Um, again, via text or 7946-852071, or you can go onto slido.com and join as a participant with 92828. So any questions, get them in there, and uh, we'll have a period of time at the end uh, for those questions to be asked. So, Jeremy, great to have you um, with us this Saturday, Saturday evening. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm oh, good, Tony. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's really good to be able to see you. Where are you at the moment? Well, I'm in God's own county, which is Roger knows. You're in Yorkshire? Is... No, I'm in Kent. Oh, yeah. Okay, the sorry, yeah, no. The Garden sorry, of England. A little bit confused, <laughs> obviously, about God's own county, but uh, yeah, that's Kent, right. <laughs> Kent's not bad, I suppose. Thank you. Too kind. Not too so, bad. Yeah, I'm here with my wife and two of our three children. Uh, we've got two boys, 20 and 24, and then our daughter, uh, she's 25, uh, she's married, she's, uh, she's an academic, one of our sons is, is working, and the other one's a student, although he, he, he was at Manchester on the right side of the Pennines. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this interview could be ended very quickly if you, uh, if you keep this up, Jeremy, so you better behave yourself. Um, it's really good to be able to talk to you. Now, I've, I've not quite mastered Zoom fully yet, so I'm going to keep looking to the side with some of my questions here, so forgive me for that. Um, oh. But uh, it's, it's interesting, um, Jeremy, because I'm, I'm a friend of yours on Facebook. And I wonder, you know, if, you, if you're counting how many of these interviews you've had during lockdown, have you any idea how many you've had? Well, I think it's almost one a day. So I guess we've been locked down for nearly three months. So it's, I don't know, probably 60 or 70. But what I found is so many people are open to talking about cancer, talking about death, talking about mm -hmm. Christian things. So actually most haven't been churches they've been schools universities loads of businesses i think i've done 15 wow. law firms i don't know what it is wow. about lawyers and <laughs> they seem particularly and then just you know random groups of people yeah, yeah. Who've, who've kind of decided hey let's have a let's have a talk about um wow. about this topic fantastic well definitely lawyers need to hear the gospel that's for sure yeah. <laughs> um, so it's good that you're getting all these different opportunities i also noticed this on on facebook I, ho I hope you don't feel i've been stalking you on facebook i am i am your friend on facebook jeremy but you this is how you describe yourself on facebook um, you say you are a christian husband father speaker author retired banker watford fc fan cancer patient trustee now are they in any particular order uh, Christian should be first, right? Um, Absolutely, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. husband. I guess husband should be second, or I get into trouble. Maybe yeah. Watford. Maybe Watford fans should be further up the pecking order. On, no, on I was thinking further down, actually. But that's that's some else. people. Some people in a minute might think I have enough suffering in my life, but supporting <laughs> Watford is self self inflicted suffering. <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't go there tonight. We'll we'll let you off with that. Um, just tell us a little bit about your your background, um, Jeremy. What about what, your upbringing, you know, your family um, life growing up? Sure. So I grew up in a strongly Christian family, um, although I, I didn't particularly like it. And I used to argue all the time with my father. I used to tell him, you know, the Bible's not true and there is no God and this kind of thing. Um, every summer we used to go Bible smuggling behind the Iron Curtain. I assume that's Tony what you did with your summer holidays. So my father was a bit eccentric. So he'd pack up this old car with uh, four young children and we'd go off to USSR, Romania, whatever. And that did make me think because when you got to say the Soviet Union, um, outside the church, which wouldn't be in a building, it would be in someone's house, um, you'd have the KGB and they take the names and details of everyone going in. Now, if you were an 80 year old grandma or a babushka, they weren't so bothered. But if you were a younger person, they wouldn't let you get a job, they wouldn't let you go to university, you wouldn't get, be able to get somewhere to live. So there was, and often the pastor was in a labor camp. So it did occur to me as a teenager, why on earth are these people doing this? Because humanly, it was the most stupid thing to, to do. And the only reason it occurred to me was because the Christian faith was true. Otherwise, it was a simply idiotic decision. 
Oh, wow. So that's interesting. Yeah, that you, you sort of were smuggling Bibles. So how old were you when this was happening? Um, well, when we started, I was about 10 and my younger sister was one. My mother, who's still alive, is a bit of a saint. But then it was over about, yeah, the next seven, eight years, I guess. So until, oh, wow. I, until I went to university. Yeah. I assume that's what everybody did in their summer holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I'm sure everybody listening to you tonight would, would say that that's exactly what they've done and still do every summer. Yeah, <laughs> the show. So it's interesting you saying that you used to argue with your dad and, and um, say the Bible isn't true and not sure what you believed about God. Where, where, when did you come to a point of, of owning it for yourself then and, and coming to Christ yourself? Yeah, I think it was, you know, as a teenager, but I think as with a lot of people, Tony, it was more of a process. Um, you know, some people have a kind of dramatic Damascus Road experience, but I think with most people, it's more it's more gradual. And I think the thing that happened, which I would compare to like a jigsaw piece clicking into place was suddenly I realized that the Bible was true and that you could know Jesus Christ today. It wasn't just some dusty, boring relic from the past, but it was it was alive. He was alive and not um, a theory, but a person whom you could know. Yeah. I can totally relate to that. Um, I, I sort of had like a bit of a Damascus Road experience becoming a Christian myself when I was 25 and thought that that experience would be the same for everybody. And um, my wife, very much like you, sort of grew up in, into Christ rather than uh, having a Damascus Road experience, as you called it. You went off to university. Where, where did you go and what did you do? Yeah, I'm quite, my, my children call this my kind of man of the people act. So I'm quite <laughs> proud, if that's the right word. If I, I went to the local box down the comprehensive and somehow, yeah, I managed to get into Cambridge, which was probably an admin error. Probably there's another Jeremy Marshall out there who's still <laughs> aggrieved he didn't get an offer. So, uh, yeah. And then after, after that, my family for generations have either been pastors or teachers. But as you can see, Tony, I'm the black sheep of the family because I, oh. I'm afraid to so say I went into banking terrible oh, right yeah. oh wow and you studied history at cambridge is that right yeah i did an mba as well uh, yeah. about six seven years afterwards in in france so yeah I, I did i did history which is an interesting subject and then i did a business degree later yeah. fantastic now, it's interesting jeremy I, i've read your book and um your book sort of begins in in i think it starts off in september 2012 where you talk about discovering a, a lump on your ribs and you don't say much about your life up to that point. You were obviously married and, and had children in 2012. And you were working in banking. Was, is that right? Yeah, I worked for 35 years, Tony, in banking, in, in what's called private banking, which is advising very wealthy people all over the world. So I worked in the US, in Switzerland, uh, France and the UK, which, which is great fun. The rich are like the rest of us. They just got a lot more money. One thing I got out of that was that having a lot of money doesn't make you happy. In mm. fact, I would say some of the most miserable people I've ever met have been some of the wealthiest. And um, my last job before I got, um, yeah, before everything changed was um, in 2008, I worked for Credit Suisse for 20 odd years. And then I was headhunted to be the chief executive of a very old family owned private bank. It's one of these sort of wonderful British institutions nearly 350 years old. Uh, it's called Sea Hoare & Co. And it's still owned by the Hoare family. It's on the 11th and 12th generation of family ownership. It's the only bank in the UK which has unlimited personal liability. So that means if you own the bank, you're personally liable for its debts. And the family decided to yeah, bring in an outsider, which was me. But the family is still very much involved in the bank. And they're great fun to work with. It's got an amazing head office in Fleet Street in London. Um, they've been there since 1690. So a bit like we were seeing Roger's office earlier with the 10 of those banner behind. Yeah, I had kind of old masters, that kind of thing. So sim similar setup. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic dream job, really. Wow. How, how, how was it for you as a Christian in that environment? Yeah, I think well, Horse Bank is, is a very ethical, philanthropic bank. The city in general, the big danger is money, right? What, what's banking about? It's about making money. So as a Christian, what's the danger is you get kind of squeezed into the culture and thinking of the world. And, and money is a, is a dangerous thing. I don't think it's intrinsically wrong. You can do a lot of good with money. But as a Christian, especially dealing with wealthy people, your thinking can over time become like then that everything is about making money. And yeah, that's a challenge, right? And as Christians, we're, we're called to be in the world. We're not called to be in monasteries, I think, in the world, 
but the challenge is to remain salty, to remain different. And yeah, sometimes I got that right and sometimes not. And if you're listening to this, please do not think I'm a perfect Christian, right? I'm a banker, right? Not a pastor or vicar. <laughs> I'm not at all. No, and being a Christian is, by the way, not about being a good person. In fact, I would say it's about realizing you're not a good person. Yeah, absolutely. So back in 2012, you, you, uh, you're you being headhunted. Well, you're being headhunted. You're working for this bank. Um, great job, married, kids. Um, things are going well for you. Uh, life seems good. And then suddenly you you mention in the book that you discover this lump on your ribs. And being a typical guy, you you try and sort of think, I, I yeah. don't need to do anything with that for a little yeah, while right. until yeah. the wife gets involved. I know all about this. And yeah. then suddenly, you know, you're, you're having to go to the doctor and, and the hospital and you find out it's cancer. Yeah, that's so right. How... Yeah. Yeah. It was just a tiny, tiny lump, like a tiny pea. So, yeah, after about four months. And that's right. It was my wife that told me, stop prevaricating, go to the doctor. Um yeah, they said you've got this really rare type of cancer. It's a type of sarcoma, which is cancer of the muscle tissue, of which there are 150 subtypes. It was a particular one. And the prognosis is reasonable. Um, we caught it early. So I went through various operations. I was treated for about six months. And then um, for about two years, everything went back totally to normal. So uh, I, yeah, I went for regular tests, but then everything seemed fine. And then, uh, well, I'll come on to five years to the day in a minute, but five years plus a week ago, I was at a friend's house here in Seven Oaks having dinner and um, I went to adjust my collar. And as I did that, I felt a massive lump here on my collarbone, not like a tiny pea, but like a golf ball. And immediately within a few seconds, my life changed forever because I knew straight away it was cancer. And mm. uh, I made excuses. I said, I feel ill. I went home. I told my wife. I went back to the hospital and then, yeah, this is strange, isn't it? It's five years ago to the day. It was Friday the 13th, appropriately enough. Mm -hmm. I went back to the hospital having had tests. I was in the waiting room. The nurse said, please come through. We walked down a little corridor and on the way, she said, I'm really, really sorry. And that was the only warning I had because when I went into the room, there were quite a few people there I didn't know. And they said, look, we don't know quite how we've missed this. About a year later, by the way, they discovered it was a completely unrelated, also very rare type of cancer. But you've got tumours everywhere. Some of them are large and they're in places which are inoperable. And uh, yeah, there's not really a great deal we can do. We're sorry. So obviously the next question, Tony, you ask is, well, mm. OK, how long do you think I've got? And they would say, well, you know, you don't exactly know, but OK, 18 months. So when they said that, I burst into tears. And please don't think I'm some kind of super Christian or amazing person. No, I'm not. Having cancer is really hard. And on top of that, I've been on like a one man mission to use up all surplus NHS capacity since. If you ever read about a problem with the NHS, it's my fault. So I've had 25 <laughs> chemos. I'm in, I'm in chemo now. Wow. I've had a dozen operations. I was so that's oncology, then I own radiotherapy. Then I was blind for a while. I lost the sight in both eyes. And then in the last few weeks, because I've kind of got a bit bored of oncology and ophthalmology, I thought, let's try cardiology. So a few weeks ago, I suddenly got a high fever and chest pains. I thought I had COVID and by the way, I may have done, I don't know. But when I went to the, I went to the hair field, which is a heart specialist hospital, and they said, eventually they said, you've got pericarditis, which is inflammation of the area around the heart caused by a virus. The, the cardiologist said it's classic COVID symptoms, but you don't appear to have it. I, I just don't know. And then anyway, while I was there, they did a scan and said, oh, your tumors have grown. It's time to restart chemotherapy. So I've got my next one on Thursday next week. So, yeah, I'm like a walking one man medical disaster zone. <laughs> <laughs> I think in your book, you said something about if only the hospitals gave out frequent flyer. Yeah, yeah of, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. You're there so often. Um, so 2015, you're, you're told that you've got 18 months, um, probably around that time. Obviously, five years later, we, we're here interviewing you and talking to you about that. But you've got obviously you've heard this news and then you've got to tell your family about this. And, and how did you go about that? And, and what was their reaction? Yeah, my wife was with me when this happened. Right. Yeah, the hardest thing about cancer is the impact it has on your family. It's really hard. It imposes a lot of stress. I think sometimes it's worse for the spouse or partner of the person with the cancer than the, the, than the person. So, yeah, with my kids, we, they were at university. I didn't want to tell them on the phone. So we did a sort of death drive around the UK. Although one of our kids, when we turned up, thought we'd come to tell him that the dog had died. 
So sometimes you need a bit of light relief, right? <laughs> Um, but the, the, the thing I experience the most, Tony, in cancer is fear, right? Fear, not so much of death, but fear of dying. For example, when I was in hospital at the Mars and at Harefield a few weeks ago, yeah, it's very lonely because you're on your own, stuck in a room, no visitors, couldn't even go in the corridor. And sometimes also in treatment, I feel fear. Uh, two weeks ago, I, I had a, another cardiac MRI where you're kind of strapped to the machine and you, it feels like being in a coffin. And I, I was really afraid. I'm kind of mildly claustrophobic, but it's a feeling of being trapped. And then I remembered the words of Jesus. Look, I'm with you always, even in an MRI machine. Now, the second part I just made up, right? But Jesus did say, and it's a wonderful promise. Look, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Or maybe the most famous, one of them, or yeah, the most famous chapter in the Bible, the 23rd Psalm. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So I find the presence of God very comforting because God doesn't promise us, even if we're a Christian, to build a bypass around the valley of the shadow of death. In fact, we all must go through that valley. And in a strange way, I would say to everybody watching, welcome to my world. Because in the last five years, every time someone coughed or sneezed because I had no immune system, I felt really nervous and afraid. And now everybody feels like that. And we're all, in a sense, aren't we, going through the valley of the shadow of death. But God promises us, and that's been my powerful experience, that he'll be with us. And that's much better than a bypass, the presence of God. And then he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it's not just God's presence now. It's also that I believe I know where I'm going. And where am I going? I'm going home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, it's wonderful reading your book, actually, Jeremy, and I, I would um, advise anyone who's not ready to get a copy and read it, because I think it's it's really helpful for, for you to sort of, almost therapeutic, perhaps, for you to write things down like that and to share your experiences with people. Uh, you talk about fear, and um, I think you use the term scan, scanxiety or something when you go in for like MRI scans yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, Here's a question I want to I want to throw your way, uh, Jeremy, because I'm sure many people might want to ask this question, or maybe you've been asked this many, many times. So you're talking about God, you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about sort of someone who loves you, who's with you, walking with you through the valley of the shadow of death. But how can a loving God um, allow something like cancer or, or indeed coronavirus? What, what would be your answer to that? Yeah. But Tony, I think the first thing is I don't want to give a glib answer because that's a really difficult question. And I'm not sure any Christian can give a 100% answer to that. But this is what I would say. Christian belief, the Bible tells us that there is a creator God who made the universe. The universe is unimaginably vast, 75 trillion light years across. But he made the universe and he made us. And he made in the beginning everything good. But then evil and if you like, evil sidekicks, fear, suffering and death broke into the world like burglars breaking into your house. Now, where does evil come from? I don't know. And if you look at the world, there clearly is evil, natural evil, right? Like coronavirus and cancer. But if we're honest, there's also evil in each one of us. And if you look at the events of the last few days, you can see that. Someone who suffered a lot, a man called Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Russian dissident, was for 20 years in the Soviet labor system, slave labor system. He said this, the line between good and evil doesn't run between countries. It doesn't run between political parties. It doesn't even run between people. It runs right down the middle of each one of us. So what the Bible tells us is we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And actually, our biggest problem is not physical death. Our biggest problem is eternal death, separation from God. And we can't escape we can't escape either from the natural evil or from the moral evil, which we're on, if we're honest, is, is within each one of us. But the wonderful news, and friends, this is, this is amazing, is that God didn't leave us in, in this mess. So why, if someone says, why doesn't God do something about it? I'd say, well, let me tell you what he did do. A man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who stood up against the persecution of the Jews in the 30s, which was very rare, sadly, in Germany. He was sent to a concentration camp. Two weeks before the war end, he was executed. Just before that, he smuggled out of his jail cell a little piece of paper. On it, he'd written this, only a suffering God can help us. 
only a suffering God can help us. That's the Christian claim. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, hang on a minute. If there is a God who made the universe 75 trillion light years across, how, how can he suffer? Well, he can't. But the Christian belief is that he became a human being in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire 2000 years ago, walked the dusty streets of Palestine. And that this God man, Jesus, suffered and was afraid. I find that amazing. I'm afraid I'm suffering. Well, Jesus went through that, too. For example, he was in a garden called Gethsemane the night before he was arrested and then crucified on trumped up charges. And he was afraid. In fact, he said he was the Bible says he was sweating great drops of, of, of blood. And um, he prayed this. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup by which he meant the cup of suffering, pain and death away. But let not my will, but yours be done. So I have no choice about suffering. But Jesus had every choice because he was God. He could have stopped this whole thing at any minute. And why did he go ahead? Why did he go to the cross? Well, why did he come to die? Why did he come to suffer? Because Christians believe that the cross is the only way to get us back to God, the only way to deal with that moral evil that's within each one of us. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So for all the things that everybody in the world has done wrong, if you like, the bill has to be paid. Now, what motivated Jesus to go to the cross? Love. That's what the Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be separated from God, but shall have everlasting life. So Jesus comes to offer us life, a way out of the total mess that we're in, an answer to death. And that desire for an answer to death is really powerful. Eddie Izzard, the comedian, was recently interviewed in The Guardian. And he said this, he said, all my life, I, Eddie, have been traumatized by the death of my mother when I was six or seven from cancer. If only she or someone had come back through the clouds to tell us there's something there. When I read that, I was, I was really moved because that's the Christian claim. Yeah, that's exactly the Christian claim that there is hope in the, in the face of death because Jesus suffered and died for us on the cross. Yeah, um, I, like you, you know, I read uh, that about Eddie Izzard and uh, like you, incredibly moved by it as well. And knowing the answer as a Christian um, is Jesus, um, which, you know, he and many others are searching for, but, but don't always reach that point. We, we pray he would. Um, Jeremy, again, you know, obviously you, you sort of got incurable cancer and um, told you've got 18 months to live. Um, you're still here five years later, um, preaching the gospel like you are now, telling people about Jesus, which is fantastic. And would you say that... Um, your Christianity changed with that, um, with that, with that diagnosis of cancer. Uh, the way you saw the world, you saw God. You, did anything change, or would you say you'd always been like a consistent Christian? And and, and just <laughs> no, I certainly would. I certainly wouldn't say that, Tony. I've been consistently yeah. a very inconsistent Christian, <laughs> yeah. as indeed I think we all are, because again, being a Christian is not about being a good moral person looking mm. down on others. I think one thing I've experienced is I've experienced much more powerfully the presence of Jesus in my life. And if I think of the story of Jesus in the storm, which maybe some people watching know, and if not, here it is. Jesus says to his disciples one day, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they all get in the boat. And remember, they're experienced fishermen. They're sailing along and suddenly a huge storm breaks up and the boat begins to sink and they're terrified. And meanwhile, Jesus is asleep, right? He's asleep in the, in the boat. And that's been a bit my experience that suddenly this storm out of nothing blew up and by the way that's also coronavirus right mm. there's a very funny thing you can look it up with uh, Michael McIntyre where he pretends to be a fortune teller in 2019 <laughs> predicting all these things that are going to happen and uh, obviously the Michael McIntyre in 2019 doesn't believe a word of it so it's very strange isn't it that this storm blows up out of out of nothing and what do the disciples feel they, they doubt God's character and that's sometimes a doubt and a challenge that I have. I think, why me? And the disciples eventually very roughly wake Jesus up and say, don't you care? We're going to drown. So that's a kind of experience I think I and many people have in suffering. Mm. You know, what, what's going on? God, don't you care? Mm. Well, Jesus then calms the storm. And within a second, it goes from a raging storm, the boat going down to a dead calm mill pond. And it says something really strange and curious because it says then they were even more afraid. Mm. 
that's been my experience as well, mm. that in cancer, I've experienced much more the presence of, of Jesus and that in a way, a bigger fear drives out a lesser fear. The, mm. the fear of death is overwhelmed then if, if as has happened to me, we have this sense of the presence of, of, of God. So if you're a Christian and you're watching this, and if Jesus is in your boat, then even if he's asleep and you're going through something similar to what I've been going through, trust him because he's not really asleep. Do you think God mm. will forget us? Of course not. We, mm. I once lost a friend's son on a busy beach. I felt terrible. It took us an hour and a half to find this kid. I had visions of him disappearing forever. Anyway, but God's not like us. God never forgets us. But mm. God sometimes makes us go through storms as Christians. Why? Because in storms, he has our attention. So yeah. what's changed, I've experienced much more powerfully than the, the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian, then please get Jesus into your boat. Well, you say, well, why do I need him in, in your boat? Because you're going to sink. Yeah, you're going to die. What's the death rate watching this call? 100%, right? Benjamin Franklin, the founding father, says you could avoid everything in life except death and taxes. Having worked in private banking, I can tell you that's not true. But you can't <laughs> avoid death. So we're all going to sink at one time. But that's what Jesus offers. He offers life. Jesus stands in front of a grieving sister who's grieving at the grave of her brother and says, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. So the reality of that presence of Jesus Christ, Tony, that's what's changed in my life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I was just thinking as you were saying that, again, something you, you um, said in your book, you quoted Dr. Samuel Johnson, and, uh, and I've written it down here to, to read, uh, which Samuel Johnson said this, depend upon it, sir. When a man knows he's to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. And it's that idea, isn't it, that when we're aware, as you're saying, you're aware that you, time is short, that we're all going to die, that suddenly your mind is concentrated on, on, on what's important. And to really seek after that presence of God, which, which you have, Jeremy. Yeah, and Tony, also a word here for the Christian. Mm. So if, if you're watching and you're a Christian, this is the best time in 100 years to be a Christian. Why? Because what we have on offer is really attractive, really mm. attractive. That's why so many people are dialing in. What do we have? We have hope in the face of death, right? If you go and read Richard Dawkins' God Delusion, there's no hope there. None. Yeah, that's that's what Dawkins says. Dawkins says, yeah. the universe has nothing to say to us but blind, pitiless indifference. Yeah. As a Christian, I couldn't disagree more. No, we have hope. We have hope. We, we have, an, we have a, a, an offer that Jesus said. Jesus, at the end of the Bible, says, I have the keys of death and hell. Mm. Now, if we have the keys of something, of a house or a car, what does that mean? It means we own it. That's what Jesus says. I own death. What about if people said to you, this is just wishful thinking, uh, Jeremy? <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just a Christianity is just a crutch. Yeah. No, look, that's a fair question. And um, I, I can understand why people think that. This is what I would say. Christianity stands or falls on this question. On the morning of Easter Sunday, AD 33 or 34, if you were there in Jerusalem with an iPhone, could you have recorded what the eyewitness, the four eyewitness accounts record, which is that the stone of the tomb was rolled away. Jesus came out of the tomb, having been dead for three days, having been crucified. Did that happen? Yes or no? If it didn't happen, it's the biggest contrick. And indeed, as the book says, God delusion. If it did happen, it means 2000 years ago, Jesus came back. We can know him now. And one day we can go to be with him. We can go home. So Jesus, if you like, stands in the way and each of us is going to death and says, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. Well, is that claim valid? Because if it is valid, then there's hope in the face of death. And friends, that's amazing because we're all going to die. Right. Sorry. And I keep saying this, but it's blindingly obvious. Right. Mm. We're all going to die. So the question you have to ask yourself if you're watching and you're not a Christian is, are my claims, which are just the claims of the Bible, are they true? Yes or no? Now, if we think of a car, let's imagine we go and buy a car. Now, what do we do? Well, we do a bit of research, right? We go on Auto Trader or whatever, we Google the model, and then we go to a showroom and we have a look at the car, right? We, we lift up the bonnet, we take it for a test drive, we kick the tires, and we think, is this car trustworthy? Is it reliable? It's the same thing for the Christian faith. I'm not asking you to believe something that's not true or take a leap in the dark. No, it's based on verifiable historical evidence. Now, 
the Christian faith is more than just history, okay? Because Henry VIII had six wives, but it doesn't particularly change anything. But what I'm claiming is you can know Jesus Christ today. In fact, he stands in the way and does not want you to go to eternal separation. He doesn't want you to go to eternal judgment. He says, come, he invites anybody who want will come. And if you're not sure, all I would ask is have an open mind. Have an open mind. Look at the evidence. Ask a Christian friend. Decide for yourself. I mean, it's crazy not to. What have you got to lose? It's so true. Um, well, everything you're saying, Jeremy, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. I want to just sort of, uh, before we, we finish with you and listen to Joe, um, just ask you a few other things as well. You, you've obviously in this in this past five years or so had uh, numerous opportunities um, to, to share the gospel message uh, with believers and unbelievers. And um, you had an interesting opportunity to, to share at your beloved uh, Watford <laughs> Football Club, didn't you? Do you want to just tell us what happened there? Yeah, it was the fault of the pesky publishers, 10 of those. Not only did they never give me any royalties, I was obviously in a good mood <laughs> that I signed this best-selling deal. But then they, they independent of me, wrote to the, the football club and said, yeah, could you profile Jeremy? So, yeah, they, Watford, very kindly, a family kind of oriented club. They wrote an article about me and the Christian faith in the programme. And then at half time in the match just before lockdown against Wolves, they invited me onto the pitch in front of 22,000 people, which was a bit nerve wracking. Wow. And I could speak just for a couple of minutes about hope in the face of death and the Lord Jesus. How, how amazing is that? that? That's God. That's the hand of God. That's yeah. nothing to do with me. And um, a fantastic miracle happened then. Watford won the match. <laughs> Are we? Yeah. So, there is a God after all. That's, yeah, that's right. True. That's yeah. right. That is fantastic, isn't it? You know, the, the way that God opens up opportunities and, and, and doors for us that we never even knew were there, let alone try to open them. Um, so what, what else are you doing? What, what, what's your plans going forward at the moment then, Jeremy? What else have you got on the go? Well, I've been writing um, daily devotions, which you can get if you go to GAFCON, G-A-F-C-O-N Global, about, or you can look on my blog, if you like, mm. JSJ Marshall Blogspot, about how to deal with fear, suffering and death. And... Um, in those 20 devotions, I look at different parts of the Bible because I find the Bible like a medicine chest, right? If you're sick, like now with my heart issues, they give me all these tablets sometimes, which I forget to take or take double the dose. Anyway, I'm still, I'm still going, but anyway. And um, the Bible's like a medicine chest. And there's something in all the different parts of the Bible that speak to the human condition. So, for example, in the Psalms, Psalm 31, my times are in your hands. How, how true that is, mm. how true that is. You know, if you're a Christian, it, it's as if we're in a play and God will keep us on the stage for just as long as he, he needs us there. But he won't forget us. He won't forget that, that we're there. No, we're totally in the hands of God. Isn't that wonderful? We're not in our own hands. That would be terrible. Nor are we in the fans, hands of some blind, pitiless, indifferent universe. Richard Dawkins, no. If we trust in him, if we're his sons or daughters then we as christians are in the hands of almighty god and i find that amazingly comforting yeah so i just i just try and tony just try and do what i can but i, I do feel this powerful urge um yeah to share what i've got because i think now it's as if we had a cure for cancer you know if i was sitting here and i had a cure for cancer or coronavirus and i didn't tell anyone about it how stupid is that so it's the same if you're a christian christian we have to we have the answer to death one thing I've, I've found really helpful in that is um, another excellent product from that fine publishing firm, 10 of those, the word one to one. It's just simply uh, John's gospel with notes. And um, yeah, if you're a Christian watching this, yeah, invite your friends. Say, would you like to have a chat with me about the Bible? Right. It's really small. It's like that tiny, tiny. And just have a Zoom chat for 20 minutes. And I, I do that a lot with friends of mine and I found it amazing. And if you're not a Christian, that's a good way of kicking the tires. Ask your Christian friend any difficult question you like. There we are. Stir the pot a bit. Yeah, go ahead. Ask them anything you like. As Christians, we, we're not here to browbeat you. We're on a search for truth because we believe we found truth. We believe we found the maker of the universe. And yeah, please ask us anything you like and ask me anything you like or, or Joe in a minute. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Jeremy. I, I was going to mention about you being a blogger. I, I've been reading some of your blogs this week, and I was particularly going to talk about Psalm 31, 14 and 15, about the time oh, in your hands. I stole no, your great. thunder. It's great when, <laughs> when, when a plan comes together. 
uh, again, just encourage people to um, to look at Jeremy's blog, and um, yeah, some just some real pearls of wisdom um, in there in, in in these days. Final thing before we uh, we move on to Joe, uh, Jeremy, uh, tell us a little bit about Kingdom Bank. What is Kingdom Bank? Yeah, the, just a quick a quick word. Then Kingdom Bank is a Christian bank that exists to lend money to churches and to Christian charities. Sixty years old and uh, owned by the Assemblies of God, a Pentecostal denomination. They put it up for sale. So a group of us, including, I'm afraid, me, yeah, <laughs> uh, we bought it, as you do. That's a great line. I, I just bought a bank. And uh, we want to develop it because we think there's great opportunities here for, for churches and lots of churches. For example, in Scotland, lots of, sadly, the traditional denominations are completely collapsing. In Aberdeen, half of the Church of Scotland buildings have either been sold or for sale. But out of the kind of wreckage of these historic denominations, which I'm afraid in many cases have kind of given up um, believing really in the, in the truth of the Bible, new life is coming. So we want to help that, that process. And also there's lots of good that Christians can do. A lot of churches do, you know, um, food banks, helping people who are out of work, all sorts of things. So we, that, that's what Kingdom Bank's about. Um, and for people watching, I'd say, especially if you're, yeah, if you're interested, you can just Google Kingdom Bank and, and deposits help us do loans. And um, you're covered by the government financial service compensation scheme guarantee up to £85,000, which applies to all banks in the UK. Your deposits are guaranteed. Although, of course, we, as you would expect, only run the bank in a prudent way. In, end of, of commercial. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good commercial uh, a good place for us to, to end Jeremy thank you so much um, for, for sharing all that you shared with us tonight again I don't know if David if you could just put that screen up again just to show how people can ask questions uh, again if you've got any questions um, from anything that uh, Jeremy or Joe say this evening or, or even things they don't say but you, you want to ask a question then you can get in touch via those methods uh, either the text or on Slido. Um, it is really good to have Joe Kirby here with us uh, again this evening. And I'm gonna hand over to Joe now, who's gonna share a, a short Christian message with us. Now guys, um, thank you for that, Jeremy. I've, I've heard that for the second time now, and it's, uh, it's always a blessing to hear you. But before we get started, I want you to imagine now that I've got some kind of superpower I can turn your laptop or whatever device you're watching this on, I can turn it into a time machine. And here's my question to you. I can take you back to any period of time. Where would you go and why? So any period in your life in the past, we can go back in time to it. Which part of your life would you like to revisit? I'm sure we've all heard of, um, we've all watched Aladdin before, haven't we? And here we are, we've got this genie, this big blue genie who comes out and grants Aladdin three wishes. And anything you want, Aladdin, you can have it. Well, actually, in the Bible, there was a king called Solomon. And because God really liked him, he said, listen, a bit like Aladdin, you can have anything you want in the world. What, whatever you want, you can have it. And Solomon, he didn't ask for a long life. He didn't ask for riches. He asked for wisdom and what God did is he made him into the smartest, the, the wisest person ever to walk on planet earth. And one of his wise sayings is in Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 10, uh, which Janice read before and it says this, do not say why were the former days better than these, for you do not inquire wisely concerning this. So let me ask you again then, so have you got it in your mind? Where would you like to go back in time in your life? Perhaps you might be thinking, I'd just love to go back to before the coronavirus, before all of this was going on. And, you know, we, we've had the lockdown and social distancing. I just want normal life again. Perhaps you look at pictures of yourself and you think, I'd like to go back to when I wasn't quite as wrinkly or maybe uh, my hairline was a bit straight. And maybe you think that perhaps like Jeremy, you've been through a really rough patch and you've been suffering for a long time with health problems. And you just sort of think, oh, I'd just love to go back to those good old days when I had really good health and I could do that, this, that and the other. Or maybe uh, your children are all grown up and you would just love to, to be able to hold one of your children again, you know, like a little baby. And you just love to go back to those days when, when your kids were young. But what does King Solomon say in God's word? He says, it's not wise. It's not a good thing. It doesn't, there's no good that comes from doing this. Now that's not to mean that we can't reminisce. It's, it's a great thing to look back at the past and say, they were some good days. 
But to this point where it's you crave it and you're unhappy, Solomon says, this isn't a good thing to do. Now, uh, Jeremy was quoting Eddie, Eddie Izzard, so I'll quote someone quite contemporary as well. Uh, the singer-songwriter Adele once wrote this, and I read this when I was 24 years old, so you'll see why it kind of fits in. She said, when I was seven, I wanted to be eight. When I was eight, I wanted to be 12. When I turned 12, I just wanted to be 18. Then after that, I stopped wanting to be older. I feel like I've spent my whole life so far wishing it away, always wishing I was older, wishing I was somewhere else, wishing I could remember and wishing I could forget too. What's done is done. Turning 25 was a, a real turning point for me. Slap bang in the middle of 20s, tettering on the edge of being an old adolescent and a fully fledged adult. I missed everything about my past, the good and the bad, but only because it won't come back. But when I was in it, I wanted out. And it's true, isn't it? What Adele's saying there is there's this sort of discontentment, no matter what period of life we're in, we often think the grass is greener on the other side. Theodore Roosevelt once said this, um, comparison is the thief of joy. So here's the big question, where am I going with this? Why is it do we do this? Why do we look back at the old days and become discontent with the time we're in? What is the reason for that? Well, I could be wrong about this, but I think it's because sometimes we might not have any hope for the future. The coronavirus has certainly sort of woke us up in a lot of ways. You know, we've realized that actually, if we put all of our eggs into one basket, into the future, it can all be snatched away from us like that. Sports matches shut down, weddings canceled, jobs lost, and some of our friends have even been buried. It's all been gone overnight. Now, I don't wanna pretend that I'm the guy with all of the answers because I'm certainly not, but I would like to tell you about the hope that I found for the future, the peace that I've got for the future. And it's not in a dream, it's not in an ideology, it's not in a situation, it's in a person. And that person is called the Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news is that person, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to rescue us and loves us despite our failings. I want you to imagine now we're in a, a big auditorium and we're all sat next to each other. There's no social distancing whatsoever. And I ask you this question. I say, raise your hand now if there's anyone in this room tonight who's ever made a mess. I wonder if you would raise your hand. I know I certainly would. But the good news is this, that Jesus came to save and rescue messy, messed up people. There was once a, a pastor, a church minister, and a young man, and they were walking down a beach. And the young man looked up at the pastor and he said, you see these footprints on the sand? You see how they go astray? You see how they wander? How th there's just no evenness to them. They're all over the place. That's what I feel my life has been like. I've always been wandering, always going astray. And as he was talking, suddenly, whoosh, a wave comes in. And the pastor looks at the young man and says, yes, but remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash away all of your sins. And that's really why we've been doing these Zoom meetings. There's one message we're here to share with you, and it's this. Jesus Christ can wash away your sins. Though you've done wrong, though you've made a mess, the Lord Jesus Christ can forgive you and wash you whiter than snow. You know, they, they put nails through his hands. He'd never done anything wrong with his hands. Every time he laid hands on someone was to help people. But he had nails in his hands for all the times that you and I might have done wrong things with our hands, might have hurt people, might have written bad things. You know, they put nails through his feet for all the times that you and I might have walked to places that we know we shouldn't be there, but we stayed there anyway. They put a crown of thorns into his skull for all of the times that you and I have thought wicked, shameful thoughts. And if everyone could see the thoughts we've been thinking on this screen now, we'd feel totally embarrassed, totally ashamed. On that cross, the weight of the sin, your sin, my sin, all of the sins of the world was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ and he was crucified there. It's a bit like this, that the worst of you was laid on him and the best of the Lord Jesus Christ, his per perfect track record can be given to you as a gift. So in other words, God doesn't see Joe Kirby and his lies and his pride and his arrogance. He sees the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because I've done anything to earn it, but because Jesus offers it out as a gift 
And you, whoever you are, listen to this tonight. You too could receive that gift of eternal life. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You just receive it and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you have mercy on me? But there is a, another secret why I've got a hope for the future. And again, it's in the same person. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what makes Jesus so special? You see, we don't serve a, a savior who's dead. We serve a savior who is risen. He's conquered the grave. Um, I quite like Shakespeare. You wouldn't be able to guess it, but I can. I know quite a bit of Shakespeare in my head, actually. And Shakespeare's great, but Shakespeare is sadly he's dead. Marlon Brando is one of my favourite actors, but again, this man is dead. Sugar Ray Leonard, a fantastic boxer, but again, Sugar Ray Leonard is dead. Michael Jackson, wonderful singer, but you can stand by his grave. You see, no one has been able to conquer the grave. But Jesus has. He conquered the grave. And that's why we put our trust in him. And if there's anyone listening to this right now, if you die and then three days later come back from the dead, I'll listen very carefully to what you have to say. So it makes sense that we actually listen to the Lord Jesus Christ when he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. No man can get to heaven. No woman can get to heaven except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me leave you with uh, one final thought. I don't want to scare anyone into becoming a Christian. That's certainly not my motive. But I do want you to know this. As Jeremy said, you know, there is an urgency to our decision. None of us know when our final days are going to be. When I say the name uh, C.S. Lewis, what book comes to your mind? I think you're going to say The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, The Chronicles of Narnia. But did you know that C.S. Lewis also wrote another book called The Screwtape Letters? And for those of you who've uh, never heard of it before, it's going to sound a little bit weird. And basically, it's about this chief devil who teaches this younger devil how to deceive as many people and get them down into hell. And one day, the younger devil, he approaches the chief devil and he says, tell me, sir, what are the three most poisonous lies that I can plant into a person's mind to deceive them? And the chief devil, with a wry smile, looks at him and said, line number one. Tell them there's no such thing as God. Tell them that science has disproved God. Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, they're the guys you need to listen to. The Bible is a load of rubbish. Just ignore it. Line number two, tell them that they're a good person. If there is a God, well, you've done enough good works to earn your way into heaven and he'll accept you because you're a great person. And then line number three, which will ensure that millions upon billions of souls will be trapped in hell forever is this. Tell them they've got plenty of time. Tell them they've got all the time in the world to make a decision. My dear friends, some of us might not have plenty of time. A couple of weeks ago, I, I did a similar talk to this and I told you about my best friend and his girlfriend at 26 years old in March had no idea that she would contract the coronavirus. And very sadly now, she's no longer with us. So I plead with you tonight, if you can hear the Lord Jesus Christ calling out to you, saying, I died for you, I love you, I rose from the dead, don't resist his voice. Run into the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you deeply and he wants nothing more than for you to come to him. I'm going to close with a little prayer and perhaps something that Jeremy said, perhaps something I've said, perhaps the Lord's been speaking to you tonight. And this is just a prayer to say, yeah, I would actually like to become a Christian. It's not a magic spell or anything, but I'm just going to pray it out loud. And you can just say it in the quietness of your own home. Heavenly Father, you know everything about me. And you know that I'm a sinner. But I thank you that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I thank you that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And today, this very day, I commit my life to him and ask him to be my Lord and Saviour. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hand back over to Tony now. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for sharing with us tonight. Um, can we put the slide back on again uh, for questions, uh, please? If you've um, got any questions, you can still text them in or, or put them uh, through Slido. 
Um, also, um, as you just saw the slide come on there as well, the, with the, the Zoom email address, if you've, uh, if you've responded to, to Joe's message this evening, if uh, you want to know more about being a Christian, you'd like to receive a, um, a New Testament or some literature about Christianity, then uh, you can just get in touch with us uh, via that email address, zoom at aofe.org.uk, and uh, we'll send some stuff your way. But there's the, the number and the uh, slide on number if you've got any more questions. Hopefully we've got a few come in and I'm going to go over to Phyllis, who is uh, in charge of all such things this evening. So Phyllis, would you like to fire away any questions that we might have? Thanks, Tony. And um, the first one to Jeremy. Um, why should you as a follower of Jesus suffer in so many ways when really bad people can sail through life without problems? <laughs> wow. Well, thanks very much for the question. That question is answered in the Bible in a book called Job. So Job and a few friends of mine have compared me to Job, but actually um, I think Job had it much worse. Job has catastrophic problems. So he loses all his family, he loses his health, he loses everything. And then these three friends rock up to try and help him. And what they say is exactly what's in that question. They say, Job, you're suffering and therefore you must have done something really terrible because God doesn't treat people like that. And the comforters are wrong because that's not what God promises. God doesn't promise us as a Christian an easy life. In fact, Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And as a Christian, we can't expect to be in that bypass, as I mentioned, either a bypass around the, the, the problems of this life or indeed a bypass around death. So what I think I would say in answer to that is that that, that being a Christian is not about receiving good things for good people. And that, that's, a, that, that's really the heart of what I'm trying to say. That, you see, you see there's, there's an assumption there that if, if we supposedly do good, we get good things back. But the truth is we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, each one of us. So actually none of us deserves anything from God. Now, having said all of that, I do sometimes wonder, as I said, well, well why me? You know, why am I going through this? Do you know what? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. But of this, I'm sure that God is trustworthy, that God is trustworthy. And again, I would refer back to the story of Jesus in the storm, right? When we're experiencing the sinking of our boat, we may think, does, does God not care or is God being unfair? But God says, trust me. And that's what I'd say to any Christian watching this going through hard times. It's not easy. It's difficult. It's very difficult. But God is trustworthy. Thank you. Do you think the God who made the vastness of those trillions of miles of space is bothered with tiny little us? <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Do you know what? An atheist, I, I love that question. Thank you. An, an atheist recently tweeted trying to poke fun at Christianity, which, by the way, is fine. Go ahead, poke fun. He said, Christianity, the belief, that the infinite creator God who made the universe cares about human beings. Now, he was trying to poke fun at Christians, but this poor guy was then piled on by tens of thousands of Christians who promptly retweeted that saying, yes, that's exactly what we claim. Yeah. By the way, that's a staggering claim. Yeah. I mean, the question is brilliant because yes, that is exactly what we claim that the God who made the universe 75 trillion light years across. Think how far that is. One light year is a distance like can travel in a year. One light year is unimaginably vast, 75 trillion, yes. That God not only cares and knows about human beings, but even more amazingly became a human being. And even more amazing than that actually died as, as Joe and I were trying to explain. Yeah, so that is a mind blowing claim. And the question is, is it true? But yeah, that, that's exactly what I believe. Amen, I agree too. <laughs> Do I need to suffer to have a strong hope like you? No, I don't think so. No, there's no conditions or fine print in Jesus's offer. Jesus says, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The thing we need is we need to realize our need of God. Jesus told the following story. He said there were once two, two brothers and the younger brother comes to his father and says, I wish you were dead. I want half your money. Well, the father gives him half the money and he blows it on wine, women and song. And then a great crash crumbs. 
like coronavirus and he's reduced to poverty and he's doing what for a Jewish boy is the worst thing he's feeding pigs and he's so starving he longs to eat the pig food and then it says he came to his senses and that's what that's what we need we don't need suffering we need to come to our senses and realize oh boy I have a problem and what's the problem well it's the problem Joe was talking about which is the problem of all the things we've done wrong so the first boy in the story comes home right and the father sees him coming a long way off and he embraces him and welcomes him home and they have a big party but then there's a second brother in the story right the older brother and the older brother he thinks that god owes him and he's outside and he hasn't suffered by the way but he 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 thinks the father should should basically do him a favor and lots of people i can tell you in seven oaks are like that they think i'm a good person i never did anyone any harm and if there is a God, which is what Joe said, he's probably going to like me anyway. Anyway, this older brother, won't, he won't come in because he's so angry about this, this wasteful younger brother of his. The father comes out and urges him to come in, but he won't. And the story ends with the older brother outside. So in order to come to Christ, do we need to suffer? No. What we, what we need to realize is that we're sick, right? If I went to the Marsden and said, I'm here, and they said, well, why are you here? You're perfectly well. I would be nuts, right? It would be crazy <laughs> to go turn up at a cancer hospital looking for treatment if you were well. So in the same way to be a Christian is to realize I have a problem. And the problem is that my relationship with God is broken. And what's broken it? I have. And that's why we need get, to get back to God. So no, we don't, we don't need to suffer. No. God's done the suffering for us, actually. Mm. Thank you. And um, Jeremy, with, Jeremy, with all your suffering, do you ever get angry with God? No, you know, honestly, I don't. I don't. But I do. I do wonder. But if we if we do get angry, that's OK. I mentioned this amazing book of Job. Um, Job is incredibly angry with God. He's raging. And at the end of the story, God speaks to Job. By the way, he doesn't really answer Job's questions. And sometimes God doesn't answer my question or your question. But he does say this. He says to Job's three comforters who have been saying basically, good things never happen to uh, bad things never happen to good people the, the previous question he says to the three friends you better get job to pray for me for you because you haven't spoken well of me as my servant job has isn't that amazing so job's angry with god but god doesn't condemn that and what's job saying job wants somebody to represent him he, he, and that's also by the way the previous question yeah if you like job didn't know it was 75 trillion light years across but god job feels the immensity of god and how small he is and he's like I, I i need help i need an advocate is what he says like a lawyer if we go to court well christians would believe he's looking for jesus he's looking for jesus because that's what jesus is jesus is if you like a bridge to bridge us to the infinite creator god Thank you. Um, I have a Christian friend with terminal aggressive cancer. How can I best encourage him? That's a question from someone. Oh, my goodness. That's a great question. Right. Well, as we seem to have got stuck on the book of Job, one thing we, we have to be really careful with is, you know, we can have great theology and be incredibly unhelpful. And one thing I think as a Christian with a Christian friend is kind of bombarding people with Bible proof verses. And the one I would especially be careful with is Romans 8, 28, right? God works all things for good, which is true, right? But just to glibly quote it, what I would do is, first of all, I just, I just try and listen to the friend. How, how can I help? You know, Job's comforters were doing all right until they started to talk, right? There's a warning there for us. So just to listen to the person to try and understand. Um, next, I would say, can I pray for you? Now, by the way, you could say this to someone who wasn't a Christian. Hopefully a Christian says yes. And then, do you know what I would do? I, I would read them a psalm. I find the psalms amazing. And again, you know, I've got half a dozen on my blog that I, I, I did these devotions on. Psalm 31, Psalm 16, I shall not be shaken. With the Lord at my right hand, I can stand. Psalm 23, Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around the dwellings of the just. Don't, don't we need that, friends? Because I can tell you, cancer terminal cancer and curable cancer is very lonely that's one of the strangest things about serious illness is lonely i spend half my especially now half my life just sitting around bored and and lonely and if you're in a hospice you're alone you're in pain but you know what would god ever leave his children never never isn't that amazing that that's what i would say 
God will never leave. And how do we communicate that? We communicate that, I think, through through God's word. So, yeah, look, it's it's easy to, to say the wrong thing to someone. But just to, it, in any situation where someone's troubled or, or in great need, I, I would offer to pray. And then I would say, would you mind if I read a psalm? And if we can only read one psalm, let's read the 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Isn't that amazing? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And there's, friends, supernatural power. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that's what I would, that's what I would do. Thank you. Maybe um, you've covered it in this, this last next question. Thank you for sharing of the hope that you have. Can I ask what your biggest fear is as you face the future? Yeah, I guess my biggest fear is, um, well, two things. You know, I've been in hospices, right, with people who are dying. It's pretty nasty and unpleasant. And then the impact, you know, cancer and suffering has on your on your family. Yeah. So those are those are my two two biggest fears. Yeah. I'd, um, I believe that when I die, I will immediately go to be with the Lord. I had a friend yesterday who died wonderful Christian man, 85 years old, David Ide, brain hemorrhage, died just like that. And I believe David has gone immediately to be with the Lord. So I'm not afraid of what happens afterwards, but the, the lead up to dying. And look, if you read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is a great book, um, each of the pilgrims has to go through Jordan, right? Jordan is death. And death is a death is a terrible enemy. We should never underestimate that. There's an excellent blog, if you're a Christian, on my thing, which is not mine. It's by a man called Ian Murray. It's about Martin Lloyd-Jones, some of you old enough may remember him, preparing for death. And, and he says, don't under underestimate death because death is a terrible enemy. And, and the comfort that Lloyd-Jones gives is the Christian is never alone, never alone. God will bring us this far and he will bring us home. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, maybe as we uh, round up tonight, uh, a message, and maybe it's for us all, a message for Jeremy. What a blessing you have been this evening. Thank you for your honesty, your enthusiasm and your love for the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Thank oh, you, man. Jeremy. Thank you. Over to Tony. Yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much um, for sharing as you have done with us tonight. You've been really open and, and honest and and uh, I think we've all appreciated that, really. Um, you know, and uh, we, 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 we want to pray for you, keep praying for you, um, that the Lord will sustain you, continue to use you in, in, in the many varied ways, varied ways in which you're having opportunities in these days, and you keep telling people about the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and it is a real blessing um, to be reminded again that uh, we're secure in, in Christ, that, uh, that our future is secure. And um, we can put our hope and our trust in him. So thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Joe, as well, for sharing. Um, just a couple of things just to mention um, right here at the end. Uh, you'll notice, I think, I don't know if he's always had that, but I noticed that Jeremy's name on, on Zoom has suddenly become his blog spot um, address. Um, if you want to, yeah, it's going to go up on the, on the screen there. Thank you, David. So if you want to read um, some of Jeremy's uh, blog posts, um, there's the address uh, for you to access those. And, and that's, I've read a few of those this week and been really blessed by them. So, so you can uh, read um, what Jeremy's writing about there if you want to get in touch with him. Also, we've already mentioned that if, you, uh, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus tonight or you have further questions about the Christian faith, you can get in touch with us on that Zoom address, uh, again, which is coming on the screen here, zoom at aofe.org.uk happily send you some Christian literature, try and answer some of your questions as well. Um, final thing to mention, next week, uh, I've already mentioned, Joe is going to be uh, interviewing um, a Christian convert from Islam. And um, it's, again, just fascinating to hear uh, what the Lord's doing in the lives of people and drawing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, uh, it'd be great to see some of you come along next Saturday evening. We do pray, um, all of us uh, at the A of E, that you have a fantastic Lord's Day tomorrow and that uh, you will know that, that nearness of Jesus 
that blessed peace that only he can give um, that Jeremy's been talking about tonight. So thank you so much for joining with us. Thank you so much, Jeremy, Joe, David, uh, Phyllis, Janice for the Bible reading, everyone else um, that I, I need to thank as well. Uh, every blessing and uh, take care.